Well, Thomas, it's great to have you on the podcast today. And I asked you to talk about something that maybe people weren't expecting to hear on the Talking Church podcast, a podcast for many pastors and church leaders, yeah. is talking about when God calls you out of vocational ministry. And I want to give a little bit of a caveat here of all of us are called to be ministers yeah. of the gospel. We're all called to share the gospel, no, no matter what our, our job is. Yeah. But you have a story of where you worked bivocationally in full-time ministry as well as other jobs, and you felt God calling you out of that. And so that's the premise of this conversation. But before that, can you just share a little bit about where you're at right now uh, for those who don't know who you are? If, if people are wondering, maybe you sound a bit familiar. We did release one of your all-staff teachings that's true. as that a podcast true. episode. Yeah. And so they would go, ah. That's where I remember hearing your voice. But tell us a little bit about you, and then I have many questions for you as you share an uh, authentic journey of where God has brought you through in vocational ministry, out of it, back in in some ways through eldership. So Yeah. So, so Logan, you want to concentrate on where I'm now and what do yeah. I do now? Yeah, what do you do now and, and where God has you today? Yeah. So, Logan, I work for a company called Excel Energy. It's a utility company. We, we generate electricity for eight states in the U.S. We also buy and sell natural gas. And I'm one of the technology leaders at Excel. Uh, that's what I do as a profession. Um, on top of that, I am honored that I get to be one of the elders at River Valley. Truthfully, I enjoy the latter more than the former. Uh, that's where I am. Uh, became a part of River Valley. It'll be surprising Logan, I just walked into River Valley 12 years ago without knowing a single soul. Uh, our boys used to go to a school called Christian Heritage Academy. That's where I went. I know, I know. So there were a bunch of kids there whose parents talked about River Valley. That's all I knew. This was after I let go of my pastoring responsibilities. I walked in, I remember to this day walking through the double doors behind saying, Lord, what am I doing here? And fast forward 12 years, enjoying every day I get to spend at River Valley. Mm. Well, we enjoy every day that you're with us. And we're so glad that you did walk through those double doors 12 years Thanks, ago. But before that, you were working in in the ministry. Yeah. Now you mentioned your your bivocational throughout this time, and um, of course, we can talk about maybe some of the challenges of that. Of of am I what am I able to give myself to? In some yeah. ways, as an elder, you're kind of that way. You're bivocational, even though the elder maybe isn't a job vocation. It's a responsibility Very that, true. of course, the Lord has asked you to do. But can you take us back to? your initial call into ministry feeling, yeah. why do I want to go work? And and I'm sure for many people who are listening, there are a lot who are bivocational or part-time at the church, part-time somewhere else, or maybe even working two full-time jobs. Maybe their church doesn't pay them anything. Yeah. But for you, you felt called to be a pastor and to be in the ministry. Talk about the beginning of that journey. Yeah. Logan, let me take you back to how the journey started. So there's a context in the things I'm going to share down the road. I was born in South India, in the southernmost tip of India. Got to know Christ in a youth camp. Uh, that's another story for another day. A year from there, that's when the Lord called me for the very first time to lead. Right. Uh, this was a time back in India where youth groups were not a common thing. Churches didn't have youth groups. I mean, they had Bible studies for kids, but that's about it, right? That's just a Bible study just before the main service. So my sister and I, we started one of the first youth groups in our town. And then we started the second one uh, back in our school. Then we started a third one in a different location in, within the same city. And then I started the fourth one in the college where I studied. So my sister and I, we, it was the first time where I got to serve Christ with somebody. And that's when God started breathing in me a shepherd heart. Uh, as I was preparing for this day, Logan, I was just kind of reflecting, okay, when did this all start? And that's when God, not only he started to expose that, he started people around me acknowledge that calling in me. Because I think it's both, right? It's, it's God telling you and also people around you, people that you love and respect kind of reinforcing that call. Finished my engineering, went up to North India, that's where I could really sense spiritual darkness. There's a big difference between South India and North India. 
that's when i understood how difficult it is to serve in a very dark region so god started mentoring me and strengthening me during that season then i wanted to do my mba i applied to australia i applied to the us went to australia it's it's almost a joke logan i had to leave that after one semester because i could not understand the accent of some of the teachers from new zealand the aussie accent i could understand i mean think about the ways god has been directing just because i could not understand the accent of accent of two of my teachers i came to the us and then i go to i was a part of intervarsity christian fellowship i uh, went to a conference and god just reinforced me so much and and just kind of rekindled that call in me came to minnesota uh, after my mba that's when i got attached to a small indian fellowship called the bread of life it was just five families logan at that time from there the 11 years i got to spend with them that morphed into a church and that's where my pastoral heart started to grow god started to strengthen me i knew how hard it was as much as how much beautiful it was i knew how hard it was to pastor right and then i'm sure down the road we'll talk about how i exited out of that and then you know i continued working in this in the in the world in the marketplace so as you're as you're starting with bread of life you're you're pastoring this church you're yeah. pastoring people where most of them were indian or most of them were indians yeah. yep and so you're you're stepping into this what feels to be you know the the thing you're supposed to do at this time how how did you know that that was what you're supposed to do or did you like some people feel like i had a call to do this or did you just feel like it was the right thing at the right time and it just was a continued progression or was there a time where where did people push you into you should be the pastor of this church or was it just immediate right away you took that leadership role so logan i would say it's a bit of both so the the so called elders at that little fellowship which were three families they wanted me to step in they made it very clear thomas we see the leadership in you we see the passion that you carry for christ we want you to step in but that's not enough for me right that's not enough for me so literally i said you got to give me a couple months to think about this to pray about this to really sense the presence of god in it and i remember uh like i did my schooling back in louisville louisville is home away from home for us so i remember going back to louisville going back to the church i was a part of when i was doing my mba because that's where that's my sweet spot where i just go back you know when i need to hear god so i went back it was just after the first service i'm sitting in this back row and logan i'm saying god you got to speak to me if i were to take this you got to speak to me and he spoke to me it was so, it was so reassuring it was beyond a doubt because the way i think logan is i mean things are going to get difficult anything that you do as a husband there are challenging moments in our marriage as a pastor there are challenging moments within a church things will always get difficult but one thing that can sustain us during that difficulty is the fact that it's the lord who wanted you there so that's why i always this before anything major i said lord you better tell me because there's going to be difficult moments and i'm going to come to you for help and at that time i'm not going to have any energy to check whether this was your will or not so i could i could get that assurance from god then i came back to minneapolis and said yes i feel that i should lead that's how i started mm-hmm. if that made sense yeah absolutely it makes total sense as you're pastoring what what is going through your mind as you're there for 11 years i mean did you love what you did did you your bivocational i'm sure there's some challenges in that with your family was your family all in your your boys were they born yet what what take us through maybe just a, a glimpse of what that 11 year journey looked like yeah so before i get into a little bit of details look in the biggest challenge was how do you take a small fellowship not a church a fellowship and morph it into a church you know that has its own challenges right but now we have bylaws you have you have method to the madness so it's not even not a fellowship we're a church right there are there are some frameworks that that needs to be put in place so there's always that challenge the second challenge was 
this is to everybody who does bivocational ministry. It is not easy, right? Because you are pulled in two different directions. At that time, I was working for a company called ADC Telecommunication, um, a company based here in the Twin Cities in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, with operations in about 30, 40 countries. So there is, there's the tug of working for a corporation and there's a tug for working within a church as a pastor, right? It's, it's different, but they both are very intense. So I think what I went through is extreme stress because of the lack of time. And Linda, my wife at the time, was doing medical residency. That's not easy, Logan. I mean, so to see her go through a rigor that she's never gone through before for eight years, her entire program was eight-year program. That's after her med school. It was hard to watch her. Then Daniel was born. He was not growing within Linda's womb. So, I mean, the doctors decided to bring him out and he was so tiny. The first year had its own challenges. Um, On top of that, I didn't think I was ready because the church went through some of the some challenges that I was personally not ready for. Now, through all this, was God faithful? Absolutely. Did God give me the grace to go through it? Absolutely. Did the church grow? 100%. Were the people blessed? 100%. Were we missions focused? 100%. So as much as I'm painting a kind of a negative picture, God was working through all this But I think the biggest challenge I faced was the fact that I was Mm bivocational. And there's only 24 hours in a a day, right? You don't get to have the 25th hour and you got to live within the 24 hours that you have. I think that was the challenge that was kind of underlying through and throughout. At the expense of of jumping past 11 years, but I think, again, it's the importance of the conversation. So that's happening. There's obviously challenges in the midst, but God is showing up. He's faithful. Take us to that point, because I do have a lot of questions on the post side of, sure. of leaving. Take us to that point of when you felt, okay, it's time for me to to say no to continuing on in the bivocational life and yeah. just focus on my, you know, secular career yeah. and lay down this ministry call. I mean, again, I don't know what yeah, verbiage yeah, yeah. you would use for yeah. it, yeah. but talk about that, that moment. So, you know... I talked about the two years where it was really hard because the church went through some struggles that was foreign to me. Like I I didn't have a, I didn't have like an experience going through that as a pastor and pastoring the people through that difficult season was hard. But the encouraging thing through that was God kept telling me through close friends of mine, hey, Thomas, stick on, persist through this you will see the faithfulness of God. Being very vulnerable, there are often I'd say, God, can you just take me out of the situation? Just pull me down. Just take me out of the situation. But all along he was saying, nope, I'm going to take you through it. I'm going to strengthen you and I'm going to strengthen the church. And God was faithful. He strengthened the church. In two years, the church became very beautiful, growing, healthy. This is the interesting part. On a Sunday morning, second worship song, we're all worshiping. My hands are raised. I'm lost in worship. And I hear a clear voice saying, Thomas, your time as a pastor of this church is over. Every time, we know, we teach about soul, spirit, body. I'm sure, Logan, you've done it a number of times. That is one of those moments where my spirit sensed it or heard it first. I remember to this day, tears were rolling from my eyes. And then my brain registered what the Lord just said. So, So remember, Logan, so back in Louisville, when the Lord said, go shepherd that church. Fast forward 10, 11 years, I hear him saying, your time as a pastor is done. 
And then there was this process, me sharing this with the elders of the church. They didn't want to let me go. I mean, fast forward six months later, we got an incredible man of God to replace me. And then I, I let go that phase of my life. It's a moment that in some ways do you feel was out in left field? It was a surprise to you or do you feel like that was a confirmation of what was already happening in, happening in your heart? So it was, again, a little bit of both, right? When I say a little bit of both, with all the challenges, did I want to get out? Absolutely, I wanted to get out, Logan. I mean, I went through two bouts of depression during that time. Each time it took me about three months even to come out of it. So for that very reason, I want to get out. But I knew that I shouldn't and I couldn't and I wouldn't get out until I heard the Lord speak. So I, that's why I say it is a little bit of both. And, and that's why I think all along in my life, I've understood there'll always be things that Thomas wants. Anything in life, right? There'll always be things that I want. But it's always beautiful when you just wait for the Lord to say, hey, this is also what I want. That's when I get the release to go and do it. So in this case, it was both. Did I want to get out? Absolutely. If you ask my flesh, are you done with this? I would say, well, two years ago, I was done with this. But that's when, you know, God started to kind of get me through that season, for which I'm very grateful for, because I don't know, Logan, how I would have processed had I left the church when it became difficult versus when I left the church when things were beautiful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Three, three groups of people that I hope that are impacted by this conversation are those who want to remain in the ministry for the rest of their life. And maybe yeah. there are people who leave the ministry to where they don't fully understand because they don't feel that tug away. Yeah. They feel, no, this is what I'm here to do for life. But maybe they can understand those who feel like their call is something different and be confident that their race is their race and the other person's race is the other person's. The second group is that there are people who maybe are in the position you were in who feel like they are burning out, they're yeah. struggling, they feel like they're ready to be finished, but they they know God's not finished with them. Right. And that's something that I want to ask you next. But, yeah. but I think that there's a tension of if our worth is in the ministry mm -hmm. versus our worth is in our obedience to what God is telling us to do, right. then, it's, then it's misplaced. Yeah. And then I think a third group of people who've already left the ministry who maybe feel guilty about it, who yeah. maybe feel like they are... are made the wrong choice or they know they made the right choice, but they feel other people don't understand them. And so did you feel like there were people, I mean, obviously your elders didn't want you to leave as you were confident. And I think this is one of the hardest things in, in Christianity. You feel the Lord has spoken something to you, yeah. but the Lord hasn't necessarily revealed that to others yet. Right. And so you're in a position to where you kind of have this, um, the God card, Yeah. But you can't manipulate that because yeah. other people haven't been on that journey. How did you process through that with your elders, with your family, with those who who felt like, well, you're abandoning us or you're, yeah. you, that's not God. Of course it's not God. He would want you to be in the ministry. How did yeah. you respond to some of those things? Patience is a key word there, Logan. You know, there's always a, a time difference between when the Lord tells you something and then when he executes it. I think we live in a fast-paced world where we just want that time duration to be zero if possible. So even in my little story, there was almost a nine-month gap, almost a year gap between the day the Lord told me to when I stepped down. Do you think the first time I told the elders, they will all say, rah, rah, okay, let's, let's figure this out? Absolutely not. There was a season of shock. And I said, okay, this is what I want to share. I'm not asking for a response. You go pray on it. I'll give you three weeks. After three weeks, we'll come back to it. And then we'll have another round of conversation. And then when they were somewhat in it, then we had to bring in some of the key members of the church. That was even more harder. You know, because in the elders bring in a, le a level of responsibility and, and, and maturity. But when you're bringing these passionate people in the church who have been with the church from, from the very beginning, they took it even harder they took a couple months to reconcile with that fact. And then we had to put a team together to find, okay, who should be the next pastor? Because I made it very clear, church, you need a full-time pastor. 
You can't have a bivocational pastor. I'll help you through it. We'll put together a team of people. And, and, and so it was a process. I don't want to belabor that, but it was a process. And when the new pastor took over, I literally felt a sense of release where the church was releasing me. Now, as a pastor to every pastor out there who's speaking, who's hearing my voice, there's always a burden a pastor carries. A sh- you know, the shepherd carries a deep burden for the people in the church. I remember even six months after I stepped out, a good friend of mine who's also a pastor said, Thomas, I need to talk to you. He pulls me aside and say, hey, I still see that burden that you carry but it's time for you to release it. I didn't know how much he knew. I don't know how much he was talking because it was a fairly new friend of mine. But the Spirit of God kind of came over him and started speaking so clearly. I remember he just laid his hands on my shoulders and Logan, that burden just got released. Hmm. So whether it's the elders releasing me plus the key members of the church, the church then themselves or the church in its entirety and the Lord saying, okay, I'll take the burden off you now. Hmm. Uh, And the whole thing took over a year, year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the process of major decisions, you know, we wish that they were to happen quickly, but you know, my wife and I, we built a house and it took a year to get done. Big things take time. And I think unfortunately our impatience, you know, the first thing you said was patience, but our impatience is what leads us to maybe rushing into something. Now, of course, there's the other side where you can wait too long and sometimes you just need to jump. Totally. Um, They're totally, they're both true, but you, at this point, you release this burden, you get the church to the point where there's somebody who you know is the right person to lead. Is that right after that when you went and walked into River Valley? Yeah. So about a year after that. So you over that year, you're processing through a lot of emotions as somebody, and I think this is probably the most difficult and maybe relatable thing for those who used to serve on staff at a church, yeah. whether it was bivocational or full-time or part-time, then just going back to being a quote-unquote regular attender. Now, I don't mean that to yeah, be yeah, derogatory, yeah. Yeah. but it's just the reality of, I knew what songs we were singing. I knew what the service order was. I was the one preaching the message. I knew the needs of the people. And now I am one of the congregation. And in a church our size, I'm sure it's easy to just blend in and and go through the motions. And that could be at any size too. But talk about your your emotions of you're sitting in service, you're hearing another pastor preach who... You don't know at this time that was, totally. you know, Pastor Rob, but yeah. there had, I mean, what was going through your mind? Was there insecurities of you, you shouldn't have given it up? That could have been you, or was it a confidence? Again, everyone's story is different, but mm-hmm, I'm curious mm-hmm. as to, as you're, as you're sitting in services, yeah. it had to feel a bit odd. Yeah, no doubt, right? It, it was, it was odd, but this is where I need to give God the glory. The first one was a test for me, which is, was my identity being a pastor as a pastor? Did I derive my identity from that title, right? Because I I think this is where the pastors struggle today. Now, I can sit here and say, okay, pastors, don't make that your identity. Your identity is you're a child of God. That's your identity. That's the first, that's the last. The rest is what you do when you're in the face of the earth. But as pastors, we are so entrenched in what we do. Logan, that becomes our identity. That becomes who we are. That becomes what we pray, That what we dream, what we think about, what we're constantly reminiscing, right? So I think the first phase was me going through that pain and understanding that my identity was that and that's not right and asking God, give me the grace to come out of it, right? Give me the strength to come out of it. Now, for me, this is my story, right, Logan? I'm not saying this is everybody's story. In my story, what drove me at that moment was, you know what? Every pastor that I can help, I'm going to help from this point on. 
behind the scenes. Because the 10, 11 years was extremely hard. So that's driven a passion in me that will ensure that every pastor that I know will not go through what I went through. So I think, I think Logan is the latter. That's giving me the drive to help other pastors that is letting me forget what I was because that was for a season. When I get to see, when I get to feel, when I, go, when I went through the pain of shepherding people, because it's not always beautiful, right? It's, it's very beautiful. It's very satisfying, but not always the case. But that's what giving me the grace to now do anything for the shepherds of this world, right? The pastors of this world. So I, I think it's, 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 the first part is checking where my identity was. And if there is a problem there, let's say, God, give me the grace to come out of it. And the second thing is, okay, now what do I do with that season, right? It's a season that God invested in me. What do I do with that now? How do I ensure that it's not wasted, right? If that makes sense, Logan. So I think it was a, a bit of both, I guess, one following the other. Yeah, but I don't want to brush by what you said because I think that in an era of church hurt yeah. and people who are hurt by people of the church, again, even the phrase church hurt, I think is is a misnomer because it's the church hurt. No, it's people in the church who hurt. Right. But I, again, I understand the phrasing. In your situation, the pain that you went through, the difficulty, and again, beautiful yeah, yeah. things, but yeah. difficult things, you turned it around and said, I'm going to, out of that yeah. struggle, I, I recognize and I empathize with pastors who deal with that. So I am going to be the person that I maybe didn't have for myself or I didn't know I needed, right. or even just be the person that I can be the best for that leader. And I think, unfortunately, so many people, they do the opposite. Yeah. They say, I was hurt by this. And because of the hurt that I have experienced, I'm going to leave and I'm going to project and shoot arrows back into the battle they're fighting, almost fighting on the other side of things and say, it's because of the pain that happened to me. That's why I'm fighting this. What I think is so admirable about your story is you said, because of the pain that I experienced, I'm going to fight the battle on behalf of others. And I think that more and more people need to grab a hold of it, not because any person deserves it, yeah. but because that's what grace does. That's yeah. what the gospel does. That's what the message does. So I, I'm encouraged by the way you've redirected your pain and challenge towards towards help yeah, and towards opportunity to, to be an arm lifter. Yeah. Right. So you, you're attending the church for a while and Pastor Rob asks you to get together. Yeah. And if I remember correctly, you thought it wasn't a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I still I still find that funny. So so he said, Hey, uh, we need to get together. And I said, Absolutely, we'll get together. Well, I'm gonna bring Becca along with me. I said, Oh my gosh, you're gonna bring Becca along. So this must be really serious. I said, Great. Uh, we need to have breakfast. I need to have Linda there, my wife. Okay, now it's getting more and more serious. I said, all right. I checked with Linda and said, you know what? Invite them over to our house. And I said, well, they, they graciously accepted the invitation. They both came and my boys were there too. And we had a beautiful breakfast, right? So the boys were finishing, Logan, their, their meal. I was, we were all finishing. And uh, your dad, Pastor Rob, looks at both the boys and says, hey, uh, can we be excused? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is getting even worse, right? He and told the boys to leave. To leave, <laughs> right. He told the boys to leave. Okay, so the boys to leave, Becca's there, my wife is there. Okay, what's going to happen now? Right. Literally what I thought, Logan, was he was going to say, you know what, Thomas, you need to leave the church and, <laughs> and ensure that you don't come into any of our 10 campuses. Well, then it was like eight campuses, <laughs> any of our eight campuses. Uh, I said, oh my gosh. Okay, so then he was going to, and then your dad, right? He just leans forward and he says, Thomas, we want you to consider going through the process of being an elder at River Valley. And literally it took me a couple seconds to understand what he was saying because I was expecting him to chuck me out of every campus. You uh, didn't do anything to deserve that. Yeah. Right? <laughs> 
But the beautiful thing was, Logan, at, at that time, God had already invested three beautiful things in my heart that I would do for River Valley. I didn't know I was going to be an elder. Uh, I've, n- I've never been, to tell you the truth, Logan, I've never been even a deacon in a campus. So, so I've never aspired for any leadership position at River Valley. But God had invested those three things. And it was so humbling to see how those three things just came out naturally after he spoke this uh, over me. As you get that request to prayerfully consider with you, with you and Linda, were you brought back to the time when in Louisville where, where the Lord said, hey, this is what you're supposed to do? I mean, I, I can't help but see the parallels of the time you had in ministry to going back, working in the marketplace, and now getting this ask again to serve again in a different role we yeah. see in in Timothy and in Corinthians the different yeah. roles of pastor and elder but to now have this role of leadership once again in the church almost maybe bringing you back to the days in South India yeah right yeah to no I, I wasn't wrong with what God was doing in my life yeah but he he had different plans of how he operated that in your right. life how he showed that through there. And I just, again, I think it's an example, but I'd love to hear your your process. If that was something you thought of, of wow, this this is that gift, or if it almost felt like, no, this is just a new chapter in the story and and I'm grateful for the journey. And, and maybe you'll say both. Yeah, but. yeah. No, no, yeah. no. This was different, Logan. This was definitely a different, right? Uh, and I'll explain that in a minute. It, even, even when the children of Israel were taken from Egypt to Canaan, uh, when they had to cross the Red Sea, they could stand back, watch the Red Sea part, and they walked on dry ground. Years later, they come through Jordan. At this time, the Lord is saying, hey, you walk, and as you walk, the water will split, right? So you, you see the difference there. Similar, so this is the evening before your dad and mom were going to come to our house for breakfast. Uh, I'm driving south on Pilot Knob, to the highway, you know, the location Mm -hmm. just south of our church. And I'm passing and I see River Valley to the right, our Apple Valley campus, sorry about that, the Apple Valley campus. Mm -hmm. And I look to the campus and I I hear a beautiful voice telling me, hey, I'm knitting your heart to this church. Logan, this is after 10 years I've been a part of River Valley less than 24 hours before your dad would ask this, I'm knitting your heart. And I could sense the spirit move. I could sense an overwhelming presence of God. And then I go to Hy-Vee, buy the things for breakfast, and I go back home. I think so this is, this is slightly different where God had actually almost audibly connected me to the church and the next day, Pastor Rob says, okay, I want you to consider. So that was slightly different, you know, the Jordan versus the Red Sea. But again, it goes back to where, you know, it was as God initiated or me initiated. So in this case, again, I can go back and rest and say, okay, this was again God initiated. Because, Logan, I cannot think of anybody carrying the office of an elder without being deeply in love with the church that they are a part of. It doesn't make sense because this is not a secular position. Now, am I in love with Excel Energy? I'm not in love with Excel Energy. They they help me pay my bills. That's not the way, you know, you connect yourself with the church. So in that case, I haven't said both. This this is different. Yes. But it's so fascinating how God works in... I think if we saw all the little moments in our life that prepared us for the future moments, yeah. we'd be shocked oh. at realizing the connection point. I think it's obvious to see some of them, yeah. right? As as we, you tell this story, but I think even the little interactions that we have, just the the way that they impact the the rest of our life, or the conversation we had with a person at a restaurant where we learned one minor lesson that impacted the the way we talked to somebody again. Just all these things, I think, that are so unique. But so so let me let, let me talk about those yeah. little conversations, Logan. So I joined Excel Energy about three years ago. I come to know that another technology leader, 
she's also a Christian. I come to know through a co-worker of mine who I knew for years. So she told me, hey, that leader, she's also a Christian. Uh, she invites me for a one-on-one. I, I didn't report to her or anything. She reports to one more one and say, hey, Thomas, I hear that you're a Christian. And I looked at her and say, I hear that you are a Christian. Right? And we have a beautiful conversation. It's one of those moments, right? And she says, Thomas, I sense darkness all over this company. And uh, I feel in my little heart that we should start a prayer group. And I'm looking at her. Logan, up to that point, even when I was doing bivocational ministry, I had separated the two. When I'm in church, I'm in church. When I have an Excel Energy badge and I'm walking into an Excel Energy facility, I'm an Excel Energy employee. I don't want the two to mix. When she started to say that, I could sense the Lord breaking that barrier and saying, Thomas, there's no more barrier. There's no more work, church, or child of God and an employee at Excel. I'm going to merge it together. We started the group. We started with five. We have over 100 people there now all across our eight states. This is the best part. When we get together to pray and encourage the way we sense the presence of God, sometimes it's even more stronger when I'm in one of the campuses at River Valley. So when the Lord said, I'm going to break that barrier, it's almost that I just let him come. Right? I just, I just let him come into my space, which is now my workspace. One more story, Logan, on this whole Excel energy. So May is Mental Health Awareness Month, right? So every corporation has to do some talk on mental health. And somebody thought that I'm a good person to talk about mental health. I have no idea how my name even came forward. And and, uh, this was a combination of what we call as employee resource groups. So we have all sorts of employee resource groups, right? We have one for the Pride Alliance, we have one for disabilities, we have one for the veterans, we have all kinds of people finding their own little group at Excel. So this was a bunch of employee resource groups coming together and they wanted me to speak in a panel, right? Um, And they made me a group of something like Asian Pacific Islander employee resource group. And they said, okay, Thomas, you're now a part of that and you're gonna go talk about mental health awareness. And uh, typical, right? You, they give you a list of questions, 12, 13 questions, you pick three. And then then came the day when we were going to do our uh, mock, uh, tr- mock uh, what is that, trial run, if I may. And this lady from the Pride Alliance, she was selected as a moderator. That means she gets to curate the entire content of the conversation. And I'm sitting in that group. There are people from HR and legal there vetting everything that will be spoken because Excel Energy logo is going to be behind it. And I'm looking at this lady who's moderating and I'm saying, hey, I have a problem. I tried my best. I cannot share about my mental health. Because Logan, I'm sure you know this. I grew in an extremely abusive family. My dad abused me terribly, right? He was an extreme alcoholic. So I I told this lady, I cannot share my journey of mental health without bringing Christ into it because he is the reason for my mental health. So I'm giving you a choice. You can just let me go. You can say, Thomas, you're out, right? And uh, that's it. Uh, I won't be offended. And you can go find another person because you still have two weeks out to the event. This is how God works, Logan. She said, go for it. Then I'm looking at HR and legal because I'm sure they would squash it. They said, go for it. Just tell them it's your story. I said, absolutely, it's my story. I'm telling them my story. So these are the, and then I got to share. I got to share. Hundreds of people watched that. Hundreds. And I got to share the gospel, how Christ was a reason for my mental health. 
So, so, so from that point, the Lord asked me to step out up to this happened, what, three months ago, Logan, right? May, so about three months ago. When you let God be, whether you have a pastoral title or whether you are a marketplace employee, let the Lord lead you, Mm -hmm. right? Let him direct you, you know, the ways and let him drive instead of you having your agenda to drive your agenda through. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. And I love how God has used you in that way. And I think that more and more people need to grab a hold of the lack of difference that the Lord sees between the, you know, some call it this secular and sacred, right? Right, right. Um, mm, but if yeah. God is if God is omnipresent, yeah, then He doesn't separate. Now, of course, um, there's spiritual components to those things. Hundred um, percent. When we gather in His name yeah. versus when we gather to worship other things, you know, like this world does. But but I do think that it's such a reminder for us whether we're in ministry or whether we're in the marketplace or whether we're a business owner or an employee. If we don't bring God with us, I mean, yeah. the sad truth is, Thomas, you can do ministry and not bring God with yeah, you. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It may seem odd for those who are outside of the ministry to yeah. realize that, but now I, I think it's very rare, yeah. but I think it can exist. You can you can lead a prayer meeting and your focus can be on what you want and not what God wants. Yeah. You can lead a service that is you focused instead of God focused. Yeah. Now it's because of our human nature, but the same can be true in our workplace. And I think that there's many people who, whether they're again, pastors, but maybe it's people in the church that are listening that would say, Oh no, I'm, I'm good to separate. Yeah. And I just think that in a culture that is crying out for Jesus, maybe they don't know they are, but they need, they need this freedom. They need freedom from their mental health. They need yeah. fr- freedom fr- from, or their lack of mental health. Yeah, yeah. It, we can't live in the shadow, you know, like our, I mean, it let your light shine before men, right? Yeah. And I th- I'm praying that your example of how God has used your story of ministry, your, your I mean, that's ministry, what you're doing. You're ministering, you're sharing the gospel. Yeah. The gospel shall be preached whether we're in a pulpit yeah. or in a panel. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's what God does. Yeah. And so I'm just grateful that you you shared this story. And I'd, I'd ask maybe the last thought you have is if there are people that are either on the fence about, I don't know if I'm supposed to remain in ministry. Now, to be very clear, I think that when God has called you to it, Absolutely, let God, you know, what. same with like marriage, what, what God puts together, let no man right. separate. Right. If God has called you to your position, don't let a person push you out of that call. Yeah. Only God should be the one that leads you out of that call. Yeah. But I do think there are maybe people that are considering that. Is that voice? Is that God? Yeah. Or maybe people who just recently stepped out who feel a guilt from people who are in the ministry who felt like that's not what you're supposed to do. They've they've said, no, this is sacred and you went to what's secular. Yeah. You're not going where you're supposed to do. But maybe those who found this podcast who are listening who yeah. can hear from you what, what you would say to somebody who's in a situation like that. So this is where I would start, Logan. We have to let God be. What I mean by that is, if God is leading a pastor to now go and work in a secular setting, in a marketplace, that person should just yield to it. Because I think subtly in our mind, we have our yardstick, and then we think it is God's yardstick. We have our plan, and we think that it is God's plan. I don't know whether we step back and let God, an infinite God, an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God, decide who should do what in what season of their lives. I often wonder how much of self, like our self, is standing in the way. Right, so, so, so in your example, when you said, okay, if a pastor wants to leave and go and work in the secular and everybody just looks down upon the poor pastor because now he's decided to go and work, I mean, is that the right thing? Is my question, right? I mean, it's, if, if that's God's will, we need to bless him and send him. 
So the picture I have in mind as you were actually sharing this question with me is in the book of Nehemiah, when Nehemiah is actually, you know, encouraging the children to build that wall around the city to fortify the wall, you know the story, Logan. I mean, it didn't go well, right? The first half, it doesn't go well. There's Sanballat and Tobiah speaking bad about them and people mocking them and people ridiculing them and the, the construction is not going well. When that happens, Nehemiah is seeking the, the face of God and then he decides this. Okay, I'm going to create two sets of people. One who's going to do extremely well with the construction and the other who's going to be protecting the whole thing. They're good with swords, they're good with shields, whatever they used those days. And he separated them and so then he creates that space for the builders to build and the protectors to protect the builders. Logan, this is my prayer that people see it this way. You are in full-time ministry. You are building, you are in the forefront, you are constructing that wall, right? I am protecting you. I'm, in, I'm behind you, Logan, right? I, I work for Excel Energy, but I pray for you. You know, I, I give to the church, so the church has plenty. Now, which one is more important? I think both are equally important. The builder cannot build without the protector. The protector cannot protect what? The protector is protecting the builder. I think, I think we just have to shatter the notion that, okay, this is the pastor, this is a secular worker, this is somebody else. I think we have unknowingly in a church setting, we have put people in tears. And that's why I continue to say, whose yardstick are you using? Whose plan are you producing? Right? I, I think that's where we just need to seek the face of God. And when you hear that, when you get that confirmation, then you go and support. Um, I mean, that's where I would land it, Logan. It's, it's funny because as you shared that, I think of that beautiful analogy of the, in the spiritual realm, right? Yeah. Of, of the protecting and the building. But then on the, the other side of that same coin, I see myself as a pastor to be actually the person that uh -huh. says, you share your story about the people you meet every day. Yeah, I'm surrounded by believers all the time. Now, of course I get out of my bubble and yeah. I go and I have neighbors and I have you know friends and former coworkers and people I meet in the community. Yeah, But my responsibility is to equip you. Right. And to 100%. equip the church. And so I think I think it's both and it it's is. it's this back and forth of this beauty to say, no, I'm building, you're protecting, but yeah. also I'm leading and you're going. Right. And you're evangelizing and, and letting the gospel be preached. Now I'm we're doing that the same together, but it's almost like I think of like an engine, like they're pistons that yeah, are up beautiful. and down. And and if 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 one side isn't working properly, this yeah. piston could go up and down all day long, but it doesn't isn't going to move anything right. in the engine. Right. And I think that that's the message of the church, right? It's like no, the the lay leaders and the pastors, it's back and forth. It's this this move. I've I've heard uh, Pastor Rob describe this as in worship, um, and it's the congregation. Yeah. Is, is worshiping. It's not the worship leader's job. It's not karaoke. It's not a concert. It's yeah. I lead and a great worship leader says, I'm going to lead. But the response from the congregation that comes back, you've been in church services that feel like, huh, this just feels a bit odd. But yeah. you've also been in services, maybe at our conference or with Seek Week where people come with expectation. 100%. And it's like the worship leader doesn't even need to sing 100%. because there's an expectation and a yeah. presence and, and a a movement of spiritual growth. And I, again, I just think that's the beauty of the conversation we've had today. But this idea of, no, the church, the body of Christ is, is the pastors and the congregation, the leaders and those who are new. If Without the new believers, the church gets stagnant. Yeah. Without the mature believers, the, the church becomes wayward, right? Yeah. And it's it's this beauty together. I mean, Ephes Ephesians talks about it. We're all the body, 100%. different parts. It's beautiful. And I just, again, I'm so passionate about this because without a piece of the body, we're not complete. 100%. And, and that's the thing too, just the diversity of the body. I mean, you coming from South India, yeah. Being in yeah. the Twin Cities, Minnesota, sitting here talking to you Absolutely. today. Absolutely. Only God. Yeah. Only God. What a beautiful yeah. story. Yeah. 
And so I'm just, I'm fired up about it because more and more people need to grab a hold of that. But it's obedience is the goal, hearing yeah. the voice of God. I mean, all throughout the Old Testament, it's, no, I've told you, I've told you. No, go do what I've told you, yeah. right? Yeah. And God, I mean, I just, I can't think of the last thought that I have and if there's anything else you want to add before we close, but hearing from God, that's the message of it all, right? Yeah. Your yeah. story is, I heard from the Lord. Yeah. And I responded accordingly. Yeah. Sometimes it was quick. Sometimes it was slow. Sometimes it was patient. Sometimes yeah. it was my own impatience got in the way. Yeah. But it's hearing from the voice of God. And, and I think that's such a great message for anyone who's out there. If you've heard from God, trust it. Yeah. Right? Trust it for sure. Yeah. I mean, Logan, when you were talking about uh, how we both work together, I think for the first time we at River Valley, in January, when we had these goals shared, we said for the first time, we said, okay, 5,000 salvations in the church. Well, we said 5,000 salvations outside the church. Mm -hmm. That spoke volumes, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're saying everything doesn't have to happen in the four walls of our 10 campuses. We are expecting the same response an outcome outside the four walls of the church, right? I mean, so that's yeah. a great way. Mm -hmm. I think we started this this year defining what success looks like for 2024. And then and then going back to the voice of God, Logan, where, where you kind of landed, it is just hard to go against God, <laughs> right? I mean, when God said, I will resist the proud, and give grace to the humble. I don't know how many of us close our eyes and think about an infinite, all omnipotent God putting his hands against our chest when we are prideful or proud and saying, I'm going to resist you. I would rather be on the other side where I'm going to choose to be humble so that his grace can be poured on me, so that his strength will always, because I shudder the moment when God's going to put his hands against my chest and say, you're not going anywhere. Until you fix the pride in you, you're not going anywhere. An infinite God. That's a day that I, want, I don't want to go through. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Uh, it's... Few things in scripture are as illustrative as that. Right. That right. opposition, but I think in, in the same way, it's the grace of the humble, right? Yeah. It's we come with a humble heart. We come yeah. with a posture that says, here I am, Lord, use me. Exactly. Send me where you want me to send me. Go. Exactly. I'll go where you want me to go. And I love that that has been an attitude in your life as you yeah. continue to serve here as an elder and continue to minister in your workplace and the doors that God opens. And even to be on this podcast today, I appreciate the voice that you've given to uh, all those who are hearing it today and the, the web of your life that has brought you all over the world and has landed you here. It's a privilege to get to sit down and be a friend to you, uh, both in life and in ministry. Thank you, Logan. Thank you for this time. Blessings. Hey, thanks so much for listening to Talking Church on YouTube. If you like this podcast, make sure to click the like button below so more people can find this episode. And if you're not yet subscribed, make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode. We're releasing a video every week with new topics related to church and ministry. So join us as we continue to talk church.